And uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Tandi uh, uh, to introduce everyone and to take the lead. Over to you, Tandi. Thank you, uh, Feroz. Greatly appreciate all of your work that you've been doing to get us to where we are now, as well as your history of struggle. Greatly appreciate it. My name is Tanda Cizwe Shimaringa, and I am currently a board member of Cooperation Jackson, which is working on building practical, tangible, the kind that you can touch, solidarity, economy, self-determination in Jackson, Mississippi. I wanted to do this program tonight as an extension of a conversation we had on May Day, May 1st, a day of a day long of uh, day of programming. And because of technical difficulties, we had to rush and cut things short. But because of the time we are living in, the issues were so prescient uh, and the time was so short, we said, why not do this again? Uh, try to take some more time, really delve into these issues and have a good conversation amongst allies. Um, I'm sorry. People are sending me texts as, uh, as I speak. So I uh, wanted to talk with some allies who have got a history of struggling in their own communities and working with other people of color and working shoulder to shoulder with uh, African Black people. If, you've, if you're tuning in on Facebook, if you've been to the event page for this, you'll see a snippet of their biographies on the flyer and a lot of them are identified with academic institutions. I know all of these people, either working directly with them or through people who have worked with them. And the reason I thought they would be good fits for this program, for myself and my co-host, uh, Saki Hall, who's currently in, physically in Jackson, Mississippi, working with Cooperation Jackson, a co-founder of Cooperation Jackson. The reason these people were chosen is because they are not just in the academy, but they have their feet firmly planted in their own communities, doing mutual aid, solidarity, grassroots work, the kind of work that's needed to get us not only through uh, this pandemic we find ourselves in, COVID-19, but the kind of work that we're going to need to survive and create a new world as uh, allies. And so, uh, Saki, did you wanna say a few words before we introduce our panelists? Our, our round, round table conversation, as I should say. <laughs> My daughter just did a video bomb. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited um, to be on this time. On May Day, I um, was more so in the background doing some tech support, and so I didn't get to engage in the conversation. Um, but I found it really interesting, and I'm glad that we're able to um, do this again. Um, and I'm hoping that we can all stay connected, especially since um, folks in um, the different areas that you all are in are um, participating in um, and growing and developing solidarity economy practices um, as well. Um, and then I, I think before we start, we can also do um, an acknowledgement of, we don't Bye. have a photo showing. Um, right now, maybe we can flash it at some point, but an acknowledgement of our um, shared ancestors. Um, uh, today is May 19th, uh, and that is, um, it happens to be the birthday of four great revolutionaries. Um, um, and, you know, the background and the Black radical tradition that I come out of, uh, we have Malcolm X, um, who would be 95, I believe. Um, uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, is, um, can be celebrated today, um, Yuri uh, Kojiyama, and Lorraine Hansberry. Um, and so we want to um, lift them up um, and celebrate their lives and their contributions um, to their individual communities, um, struggles, and then also um, the, the relationships and the interactions that they had um, as black and brown, Asian and um, African people. So just taking a minute to observe them um, as a, as, and the relationships and solidarity that we're talking about being able to have strengthen and, and build or rebuild um, really 
uh, is a continuation of, of the work and struggles that they participated in. Um, Tani, do you want to go ahead and introduce everybody, I, um, kind of do an introduction of everybody before we get started? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, we are joined by so many, so many folks. Uh, and I'm going to start with basically what I see on my screen. Yvonne Yin Liu is a co-founder and director of research for the Solidarity Research Center which is primarily concerned with not only research, but the practical ac applications of uh, solidarity and cooperative economy. And she's based in the El Sereno area, which is just um, east, maybe northeast of Los Angeles. Uh, Yvonne, if I am uh, butchering up your bio, please let me know. She's a professor at Cal State, currently a professor at Cal State University, I believe Los Angeles, but again, uh, she's got her feet firmly planted in the community. I've forgotten the name of the community center in El Sereno and have been there so many times, I really ought to be ashamed of myself. But she can talk about that uh, when she gets on the mic. Uh, one of the areas, the basis of operation where the Solidarity Research Center works. We've got Connie One, who is um, director of the, is it Asian American? Asian Pacific, Asian American Pacific Islander Women uh, political organization based in the Bay Area. She's also a professor, but she is also, she is a PhD, not necessarily a professor. She's pointing at me on screen. <laughs> she is a PhD. She is a doctor, but not currently teaching on <laughs> on the uh, uh, university level, but she is also a survivor of sex trafficking and she is intimately involved in sex work. She's intimately involved in sex work and that will be an interesting part of the discussion perhaps at some point. Uh, but again, again, uh, very involved in grassroots community work and also with restorative justice and accountability practices in the uh, Asian American and uh, Asian American and African American community. We also have uh, Dylan Rodriguez, currently a professor at UC uh, Riverside and author uh, around the issues of ab abolition, political prisoners, and working with mutual aid in Riverside, California. Again, another person whose feet are firmly planted on the ground in their communities. I was hoping Connie Hun would be here. Did I miss Connie? I'm here. Connie's there. Oh, hey. hey. Connie is the, the current, uh, is it chairperson or director? What is your title, Connie? Chairperson. Of Affirm, the Association of Filipinas Fighting Imperialism, Refutalization. I, I, think I may have missed one of them. Association of Fili Philippines. It's a bunch of them. Fil fighting Remarginalization, Feudalism, and Imperialism based in the Philippines, but an international organization, international feminist organization, fierce organization. And she can please tell us more about it. And uh, Diane Fugino, who's currently a professor at UC Santa Barbara, an author, uh, firmly feet planted in the ground with a cooperative network on the ground, which is uh, just now getting up in Santa Barbara, California. But also author of a biography on Yuri Kochiyama, uh, Richard Aoki, and you've got a, I believe you've got another book come, due out this summer on the Black Panther Party with your partner, Matef Harmakas, is that correct? Okay, you can tell us, please tell us all about that work also. So in addition to her writing, her research, her academic work, she is also working with a mutual aid network in Santa Barbara, a place that we're not necessarily uh, used to associating with mutual aid and cooperative uh, economics. So it'll be very interesting to uh, talk about that. And please uh, forgive me if I have butchered anyone's bio and left anything out. And we also, of course, our co-host Feroz Manji, the creator, founder of Daraja Press, which is the publisher of Jackson Rising, talking about the rise of a solidarity economy and the fight for self-determination in Jackson, Mississippi. And for Rose, who uh, 
tries to be humble and not really tell his business, has also written or helped to write extensively about the role of China and other imperialist incursions into Africa. So we've got some good folks who are available tonight. And of course, you who are watching, you who are watching, we want you to participate also. We're gonna to try to get in your comments and your questions. So I'm gonna kick it now to, um, to Saki and uh, let's roll. Unless she's being bombed again by her little ones. <laughs> um, no, I'm not. They're definitely um, over on the other side of the house so that I can fully participate. Um, but I, I wanted to, I guess, give folks who are watching and I'm able to see there uh, is a nice group of folks who've joined us on Facebook so far, um, give people a sense of um, the different areas that we want to talk about tonight. Um, and we have plenty of time to, to dig in deep. Um, so the, the theme is really around solidarity with African and Asian people. And we know that, um, that each of those groups consist of a uh, very, um, like a, a lot of different communities, right? Um, and so I'm hoping that we can dig into and be specific when we're talking about even the complexities and the contradictions that exist within um, the, the two communities and, and then how we relate to each other. Um, when Feroz and Tandi and I were talking, um, we talked about being able to touch on the history of the relationships um, and then bring it fast forward to now um, in terms of uh, tensions um, that exist, uh, anti-Asian sentiments, anti-Blackness uh, within um, the various communities, uh, talking even on a, with an international lens about what we see happening um, and uh, as folks who are within the diaspora, what we see happening outside um, in terms of relationships. Um, and then I think um, it makes sense to really be able to uh, think about and provide uh, an analysis on in terms of where we go from here. Um, and then we would be remiss not to talk about kind of uh, the impact that the conditions that we find ourselves in now with the current health uh, crisis, really, uh, this, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the role um, that it is uh, playing and ripping havoc within our communities. Um, I really hope that folks are able to share um, examples and stories of not only the problems that we're facing and the problems that exist when we talk about our community's relationships to each other, but talk about uh, a way forward, what we see um, happening, uh, examples and moments and stories of, of, of uh, positive relationships that we see happening and where we think we go from here as revolutionaries, what is the uh, what is our objective when we're talking about solidarity amongst uh, our different communities? Um, you know, uh, let me jump in real quick. I wanted to uh, say I'm sorry. I want to apologize. I'm getting texts and trying to respond to texts and without ignoring people. I'm on live. Stop texting me, right? But I wanted to say that it's important to give voice to what people's concerns are. And mm -hmm. this time that we're living in, the time of coronavirus and COVID-19, uh, it's such an extremely volatile time. Uh, when this whole pandemic began, we saw the, unfortunately, the president of this nation, um, you know, making it a point to cross out in his daily briefings, to cross out notes that said a coronavirus and label it a Chinese virus. Um, you know, the, the United States of America is a is an illegitimate settler colonial nation. It is a white supremacist nation. So we understand that xenophobia is part and parcel of its fabric. So we, we understand that there are also strategic interests that the United States of America has that it might be in competition with China about. So there, we understand that there's an attempt to create this climate 
of anti-Asian sentiment, of anti-Chinese sentiment. And it's important, again, as I said, to give voice to people's concerns because we don't, as revolutionaries, we know we cannot play into that. But when we talk about the fact that we can't play into that, when we talk about the fact that America is being xenophobic and doing this on purpose, we have, for example, black people who say, well, what about the way black people are being treated in Africa by Asians, specifically Chinese who are in Africa, building infrastructure, making investments. It's important to give voice to black people's concern when they say, what about black people who are in China who are being discriminated against, who are being thrown out? It's important to give voice to black people's concerns when they say, what about the way black people in the US are treated when they go to Asian businesses, perhaps beauty salons, beauty supply places, nail shops, getting pedicures, and the way that, they, that, that hands are laid on them by Asian shop owners. You know, this is bigger than those incidents, but it's also about those incidents, right? And so it's important that we give voice to Black people's frustrations and concerns because when you don't give voice to people's frustrations and concerns, we know what happens. And so that's one of the reasons I really wanted Diane to be here tonight, in particular Diane and Dylan, as uh, authors who have a long memory, as young as they are, they can talk about those concrete examples of history and solidarity, not just looking at individual personalities. I think that our histories are given life and given form when we see actual people who lived, but we also understand it's bigger than personalities. We understand that sometimes movements are exemplified by personalities. And so if we can maybe start with the, the history, I've just tried to give a little bit of voice to concerns that people have brought to me. You know, when I was publicizing this, people were saying, well, are they gonna talk about the beauty supply shops? And I said, well, why don't you come on and uh, make sure that you're, you ask that question about the beauty supply shops. But I, I, I also wanna really stress that there's this history and, and, and real quick, and I'll shut up. Uh, here in Los Angeles, where I'm from, there's an area around, uh, it's, it's part of Lamert Park. And a part of it lies geographically just outside of the area of Lamert Park. People who are familiar with LA know that Lamert Park is one of the hearts if not the heart of the Black LA cultural community. And when you go through this area in Lamert Park, you see a lot of, I don't know the technical name of it, but they're Japanese trees. This is an area that was heavily populated by Japanese Americans during the 1930s and 1940s. And one of the, the stories or some of the folklore, I'm not gonna call it a myth, I'm not gonna call it hearsay or rumor, I just call it folklore. One of the folklores that we have here in Los Angeles is that during World War II, when so many of our brothers and sisters were taken away to concentration camps, uh, black families, black neighbors looked after their property for them in the hopes that when they returned, they would have something uh, still, uh, that it would not be taken up, that it would not be usurped. Uh, there's even a theater company here in Los Angeles, I believe it's called the Roby theater company that staged a play a couple of years ago. And of course, the name of the play escapes me, but it, talk, it centered on a black family that sheltered a young Japanese boy who refused to go to the camps and the family did not give him up. And so uh, Diane, if there's no objections from anyone else, if you can uh, give us uh, a historical breakdown and uh, also Dylan, if you can jump in at a certain point when Diane finishes and I'm gonna shut up. <clears throat> Thank you, Sister Tandi, Saki, Feroz for hosting this. And I think that the very act of your hosting this, right? And bringing on Asian American uh, panelists and activists to think about Asian black relations in the times of COVID is an act of Black Asian solidarity. And so I thank you for that because so often what we see is Asian Americans 
looking to the Black movement, looking to Black studies, looking to Black history for inspiration and example, and also standing in solidarity with anti-Blackness, but we don't see it in the reverse as much. And this is an example of that. And Sister Tondi, the things that you were talking about in the Lamert Park area, in the Crenshaw area, right? There were Black and Asian, especially Black and Japanese, um, living next to each other in part because of segregation, right? That happened in Gardena. It happened in certain areas. And we know during World War II, when the Japanese were removed and put into concentration camps, Blacks moved into the Little Tokyos. And after um, the Japanese returned, for example, in the immediate post-war times, when they were trying to already that early on gentrify Little Tokyo, and they were, um, they, they were, um, removing or, 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 or trying to reduce the property of Little Tokyo to build police stations. The, there was a tenants union, a tenants group that was primarily black um, tenants along with Japanese Americans in the Nisei progressives that fought hand in hand against gentrification. So I think we do have a lot of examples of this kind of solidarity. Um, I think I wanna start with Yuri Kochiyama, right? On her birthday. Um, in part because she is the foremost political mentor to me um, and somebody that I feel very grateful that I um, knew personally. And a few years ago, I was in Palestine on a political delegation led by Dr. Rabab Abdulhadi. And when we were there, there was an Arabic word that people kept using all the time, smud, which means steadfastness. And I think that this is a word that absolutely applies to Yuri Kochiyama, right? She was steadfast in all that she did for years and years, even before she became political. She was um, working in community service. And once she became politicized through the civil rights movement, and then especially through knowing Malcolm X, um, she, she um, never stopped through thick and thin, through Tra tragedies in her own family, through difficulties, through um, all kinds of hardships in the, in the movement, through the arrests and um, killings of her comrades in the movement, she just kept going. And, um, and so I really want to honor her and pay tribute to her. And at this moment, when we're talking about Black Asian solidarity, I think Yuri is really an example of this as well, because she wasn't somebody who worked out of self-interest or to try to get her 15 minutes of fame. She was someone who was steadfast and there always. And I'm thinking about um, Mutulu Shakur, who was with the Republic of New Africa, and they worked together in a political prisoner group in Harlem. And he's currently a political prisoner, been a political prisoner for a few decades now. And um, Mutulu Shakur said that Whenever anyone got out of prison and whenever they needed to get help, the first person they called was Yuri Kochiyama. And the reason that they called her was because they knew that she wouldn't stop until she got them what they needed, whether it was connection with family or friends or legal resources or other kinds of resources. And she was somebody who always put liberation and justice and what was right at the forefront. And this is crucial in what we do. And this is a crucial element of a common basis of solidarity for all of us. The kinds of deep solidarities that Yuri Kochiyama practiced was rooted in a struggle against imperialism, a struggle against racial capitalism, and also a struggle against racialized heterosexism. Um, anyways, I, I think I'll stop. I have a lot more to say, but I think I'll stop here because there's a number of panelists. Well, before we, I, 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 okay, I'm not going to monopolize. I promise y'all I'm not, but you know, you start, just start getting into it and it's like, okay, can I add this? Can I say this? So many stalwarts in our tradition, and as Saki refers to the black radical tradition, a sister by the name of Safia Bukhari, mm -hmm. who was a member of the Black Panther Party, Right. member of the Black Liberation Army. One of the reasons why Safiya Bukhari is so important, uh, another sister by the name of Asada Shakur, mm -hmm. whose name we, the majority of us know, Asada Shakur, Zaid Malik Shakur, Sundiata, mm -hmm. Akoli, they were uh, right. 
they were ambushed on the New Jersey Turnpike in 1973. And they were captured and they were put on trial. They were eventually convicted for the murder of a state trooper. And Asada was um, um, broken out of prison in 1979. She now lives in Cuba. She's written her autobiography. Uh, her name rings out, uh, has been ringing out since 79. And you know, Black Lives Matter has what they call the Asada chant. The reason why Safiya Bukhari is important is because Safiya Bukhari was a member of the Black Liberation Army also. Mm -hmm. And as a soldier in the Black Liberation Army, along with her comrade, Masai Ehihosi, they were also captured in Virginia in 1975. They were captured after Asada was captured, but they were the first to state in open court that we are soldiers of the Black Liberation Army. We are citizens of the Republic of New Africa and as members of a freedom, freedom fighting uh, formation, the United States of America has no jurisdiction to charge us. They were the first to stand up in court and say that. And after, of course, it didn't work, they were convicted, but Safiya were, managed to break out of prison. And she told us, Yuri Kochiyama told a story one night of how she was awakened by a knock, in, knock on the door in the middle of the night and it was Safiya Bukhari. Right. And she's right. like, okay, I just gave her some money and some food and a coat and that was it. Right. I'm like, that's all, what do you mean that's all, that's it? That's major. But Yuri told the story like it was no big thing. Right. So yeah, whenever people went through Harlem, they went to see Yuri because they knew the kind of person she was. They knew that she was sincere and that she would help them. That's right. I just wanted to throw that in there. Okay, so now I got to add to this, right? So of course, Sophia Bukhari, that's such a great story, right? About her breaking out of prison. And one of the places she goes to is Yuri Kochiyama's home, right? And they were both Muslim inside going inside, visiting political prisoners, Yuri and Safiya Bukhari, and um, uh, doing, uh, engaging their Muslim practice inside the prisons together um, as sisters in this. Um, and of course, Yuri visited Asada Shakur when she was in prison and, and all of this. Um, and then Safiya Bukhari with Herman Ferguson later started Jericho, right? The political prisoner movement. Right, but this is who this is who Yuri was. Right, so thank you so much for sharing those stories. Um, Tandian mentioned Dylan being able to to jump in. Also, Dylan, can you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I really I appreciate I appreciate the the foregrounding of Sophia Bukhari, who I think. Um, even to this point remains one of the most underappreciated black liberation warriors in the, in the, in that long genealogy and tradition. Um, her, her book is something I sign in, in, in every class. I recommend it to people in and outside my courses, uh, to what, what book is that Dylan? What book is that? The war before by Safiya Bukhari instant classic. As soon as it came out, I had the pleasure of meeting her once in the early two thousands mm -hmm. and, um, she's as badass as you could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, just un unbelievable human being and just somebody whose courage just far exceeds anything I can even comprehend. I mean, somebody who was a commanding, uh, basically a field general in an underground revolutionary guerrilla struggle, struggle on U.S. soil in the late 20th century. Holy shit, right? I mean, you're talking about somebody who, who did that, is unapologetic about it, who survived it, um, who was, who's an exemplar of the Black radical genealogy, uh, who had uh, such a thoughtful and complex relationship with her people with different political ideologies and with all, all other kinds of peoples as well. Um, and you just, you just made me think, listening to uh, Diane and, and Tandi and thinking about your question, Saki, good to meet you, Saki. Um, uh, it, it, it makes me think of, of another figure um, that I think ought to be central to a discussion like this. Um, and, that's, and that's somebody named David Fagan, uh, probably not somebody that folks outside scholars of the genocidal U.S. occupation of the Philippines would be that familiar with. But for those who are familiar with that history, David Fagan's name probably rings a bell. So um, long story short is that the U.S. engages in a genocidal occupation of the Philippines at the turn of the 20th century, roughly 1899 to about 1910. Um, you know, we, the, the body counts and casualties in the Philippines are, are generally unknown, but conservative estimates, quarter of a million, up to 2 million people were basically exterminated by the U.S. occupation, directly and indirectly through military and other means. Um, part of the occupation was uh, seg were segregated regiments. And one of them was uh, the 24th Regiment, 
and it was and it was uh, partly led by a captain, black captain named David Fagan, who survived all forms of apartheid, military discrimination, racism, violence that you could imagine. So this 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 person defected. 18, early on, 1899, he fucking defected. He joined the guerrilla, anti-colonial, anti-US, anti-genocide liberation struggle of um, indigenous and Aboriginal Filipinos and Mestizo Filipinos of, of people all over the archipelago. That dude, that dude changed fucking sides and started firing at, at, at people from his own military, right? That is fucking solidarity. I'm sorry, but that to me is, is, is the template for what it means to be in solidarity with the people. And this is, a, this is somebody who, he had no reason to do this. He could have done his time, watched his back and made sure a white commanding officer didn't shoot his ass, right? And gone home and fought the struggle at home, right? A lot of people did that. But this, this is somebody who exemplifies a particular model of solidarity that really ought to shape and discipline how we understand that term. Um, uh, and, and I really do appreciate the fact, Tandi, that you brought up Safiya Bukhari, because we need to stop being apologetic about these histories of armed struggle and armed resistance against genocidal and proto-genocidal, colonial and other forms of occupation, of power, and just of everyday violence. Um, and, and so, you know, Fagan, Fagan's actually honored in the Philippines as one of, as, as one of the most successful guerrilla soldiers and leaders in the Philippines against the United States. And, um, you know, you were apologizing for for myths earlier, Tandy, I say we I say we bring with honor those myths, man, because the the story of Fagan is actually the, the 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 kind of the culmination of his story is somewhat unknown. So he's turned into a kind of mythical figure, right? And one myth has him getting captured by American soldiers and beheaded, and another myth has him um, fully fully, for lack of a better term, integrating himself into indigenous Philippine society and 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 staying in the Philippines for the rest of his life, basically becoming a black Filipino. <laughs> uh, raising a family and whatnot. Um, so I, I, you know, I know it's one story, it's one example, but to me, these these kinds these kinds of um, biographies are, are the kinds of are the kinds of uh, exemplify a kind of politics and a kind of adherence to to a, a principle of radical and liberationist solidarity that that far exceed one person's story. Well, a question that comes to mind that could bring in some of the other guests um, that you just made me think of, Dylan, um, that could maybe even help ground the conversation a little bit is what does solidarity mean to us? You're giving an example of a person who you, um, and we have a couple of examples that we've heard so far of people who uh, exemplify um, that solidarity. What does, um, if some of you can share, like what, what does that um, mean? What does that look like for, for, for you all? I can jump in here. Um, so again, my name is Connie Huynh, and um, since Tandi said that we are free to, to correct some things, um, I will just say that uh, AFFIRM stands for Association of Feminists Fighting Fascism, Imperialism, Refutalization, and Marginalization. Um, and we are actually based in the United States. Uh, our history is um, 30 years long. And so we started out as a Philippine solidarity organization, but um, uh, started in 2010 as a firm. And so we are based in the United States. Um, and that's what I will say about that. In terms of solidarity, it is actually something that we take very seriously. We practice transnational feminism. Um, and so for that, uh, what that means to us is practicing solidarity with feminist movements across the globe. So not um, sort of exporting our version of feminism here in the United States, um, but building as a process and engaging with um, feminist movements across the globe um, to support our common interests and fights um, while not trying to erase or silence or marginalize the experiences of other struggles. Um, and so I think in this moment, if we think about COVID, and we think about race as a dividing strategy um, of the ruling class. And we think of unity as a strategy of the people, right? Solidarity is like that ongoing practice of us um, engaging in camaraderie, um, but also struggling it out, right? Um, so giving voice, as Tandi said, to the different experiences of um, people and, I think that when we look at 
the current pandemic, I mean, it's so interesting because everything seems to move so quickly. And even though we've been in this for like eight or nine weeks, um, seems like so much has happened in recent months. And, um, but I think that we can look to the front lines, right? So looking at the Mayday strike and sort of like who is on the front lines, we see that the vast majority of workers that are keeping the economy going, that are caring for those um, who are falling ill are women, right? And we look at who are the women that are in that workforce that are fighting for justice, fighting for their own lives and fighting for others as we do that. Um, and we see that, you know, primarily uh, they are black women, Asian women and Latinx women. Um, and so I think that as we think about ongoing strikes and class consciousness, um, that we can look to our, like, our own front lines in this current moment and see the solidarity um, amongst uh, workers. I apologize profusely to all of my sisters in a firm. Y'all know I love you. I hope Ninochka and Jolene were not wincing when I was trying to give, uh, introduce you. Please forgive me, I'm so sorry. If I messed up the name and the history, I'm so sorry. We forgive you, Tandy, we love you too. So no worries. <laughs> Now, it's interesting that you say that you are U.S. based uh, as opposed to uh, being uh, based in the uh, Philippines. May I ask why that, uh, why that is? Yes. So, again, we, um, we come out of a Philippine solidarity organization, right, where we were supporting, um, uh, you know, movements and work in the Philippines here in the U.S. in terms of like challenging the belly of the beast um, here. And in 2010, we were sort of rebirthed um, in our current form uh, as a firm. And so we are based here. Um, and again, we organize with feminist movements all around the uh, world, not just in the Philippines. Did um, anyone else, Yvonne or um, Connie, want wanna go ahead, jump in there? <laughs> you have to take yourself off of speak mute. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I got hungry, so I threw a little cookie in my mouth. So sorry about that. Um, bad form. Um, so first, thank you, you all, for inviting us and bringing this whole team together on such an important day. Uh, I want to thank you all, the team. I'm looking at your three squares, so thank you. Uh, and then I'm excited to be on this discussion with you all. The thing about that question then, uh, I, I kind of want to take a pause real quickly because I think it's important for us to ask what, we're, what are we in solidarity for before we ask what it is, right? And so for AAPI Women Lead, which is Asian American or Asian and Pacific Islander Women Lead, we're an organization um, that works to highlight the issues of violence that impact self-identified Asian and Pacific Islander women and girls. And then we do this in quote unquote solidarity. Um, so when we, when we say, what are we in solidarity for? I think a lot about a conversation that Dylan and I had a couple of weeks ago. We interviewed Dylan uh, for our community care series. He did a good mic drop on everyone. And he reminded us that um, the anti-Asian violence climate that we are currently experiencing is, a, um, is made possible by uh, anti-Blackness, or for him specifically, it was anti-Black chattel slavery and uh, colonial world order. And for me, I would say this, this moment of anti-Asian violence is made possible, and actually anti-Asian violence period, is made possible through anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity globally. Now, if we understand that, and if we all decide we want to agree on that, and if we don't, we can have a discussion. But for us, if that's the premise of the world that we're operating under, then solidarity for us looks like a process, a long, arduous process of recognizing the ways that these systems um, or this structure impacts and shapes everything that we do. That includes the systems, the institutions, the interpersonal relationships, the, the interactions at the beauty shop, the um, things that happen in the community, the stuff that's happening online right now. Um, we have to be able to address those structures and how they impact all of these layers of being in the world, including our ethos 
and our feelings, our sensibilities. So essentially solidarity means one, that we understand that as a premise. And then two, it means that we will probably have to upend and potentially implode who we are, who we think we are, and how we operate in the world in relation to these structures in order for racial solidarity to be a goal or even a possibility. And that's a day-to-day -day, um, way of being. Right. I say that because I also know, you know, Dylan and I have been working together since I was 19 years old. Right. I wish we could say that he's 20. Hey, we still we're still young, man. Come on. But that just makes it about 20 something years of work. Right. And I remember when I was a kid, one of the things about being in solidarity, I mean, we worked with some of the most black radical like in, you know, all of us have been influenced by Black radical thought, Black radical community. And what it meant for me to be in solidarity was constantly being challenged around my own proximity to my, and my investments in white supremacy, which is different from anti-Blackness, right? So I, there was like a constant having to rethink what I understood as identity and politics. And one of the things that Dylan also says too, that I really love, but I won't tell him too often, um, is this idea about our identities being informed by our politics, not by our, you know, kind of cultural markers only, or our, um, you know, the markers by which this nation state has placed upon us. So we end up having to implode a lot of different things in order for us to build something entirely different, which I think racial solidarity must do if it wants to tackle the foundations of this world. So I'll just leave that there real quick. You, you pointing out, and I'm glad um, what you just said towards the end, the identity being informed by our politics and not necessarily the imposition of uh, what it, what has gotten created and who we've been told we are, particularly through um, the system of oppression and exploitation and white um, supremacy, automatically just like made my little hair stand because it makes mm -hmm. me see the possibility of being able to 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 grow and practice solidarity, right? Not only have it be something that's rhetorical, but something that is practiced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 if we are um, able to let our politics shape that, really it's reshaping it. And it's reshaping an identity in a way where we're able to, um, I think, better embrace our communities and then better be able to embrace each other across communities. Mm -hmm. um, you just made me think of that. <laughs> Thank you. But really, really quickly though, like, you know, the, yeah. the whole racial solidarity work is not about us getting along. That has to be, you know, completely right. destroyed. It's a misnomer. It's about us being in struggle with each other, right? It's about whether and how we're going to relate to each other, um, how we're going to be held accountable. I think a lot about the restorative justice, transformative justice folks, community accountability folks who are about holding one another accountable to the harms we may or may not commit to our own um, agencies, right? Um, as a form of recognition and uh, power building. Because I don't, I want us to really toss out the idea that solidarity means me and you are just going to be cool. It actually means we're going to struggle together. And I respect you enough to struggle with you. I hope you respect me enough to struggle with me towards all of our freedoms. Um, and recognizing that all of our freedoms may actually not all be the same. Um, and that may not, and freedom may not be a friendly struggle. In fact, it would probably be the opposite of it. Mm. Connie, if I can jump in real quick, when you talk about um, accountability, can you give us, can you talk for, for the audience we have today who may not have been able to tune in on May Day, can you talk about that incident in the Bay Area that you were uh, involved in, in terms of bringing accountability? Well, to, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, I wasn't involved in the accountability work, but Eddie Zhang was and a number of other community members um, in Bay, Bayview Hunters Point were. So the incident was um, one of a number that has been happening across the, the Bay Area and the country. Before I, I say that, you're talking about a, an interpersonal form of violence, right? I want us to think about anti-Asian violence as colonialism 
imperialism. That too is anti-Asian violence. I want to think about the health disparities that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and poor Asians are experiencing as anti-Asian violence. That way, when somebody says the stats look like Black on Asian, I'm going to say, actually, it looks like US against us. Right? So then we can reshape how we understand violence. Because then we also think, okay, um, what about the you know, educational disparities? That's also anti-Asian violence in terms of Southeast Asian communities being impacted, right? We want to think about how most of us got here to this country, which is Southeast Asian, like a lot of us are war refugees, children of war refugees, climate refugees. That, how we got here is anti-Asian violence. So let me reframe that and then broaden it to implicate way more people than whoever's being seen on TV or social media. I had to come off mute so I could say I say out loud. Thank you. Do your thing, girl. Do your thing. I just came from a two hour talk, but it's just a whole different. It's really important for us to be like, no, this is what it looks like. It's bigger than this moment. Right. And then honing in, we can then say, OK, I so on Hunter's point. Right. In Hunter's point, in a predominantly a very poor historical, like historically poor community of um, predominantly black communities. What happened was uh, an older Chinese man um, who collects cans for a living uh, was pushing the, the cart around his shopping cart around and a couple of younger black men. Um, approached him and did racial slur, had, you know, made, said a whole bunch of racial slurs. Um, one person threatened to harm him and threw like kind of, I can think like, uh, kind of attacked him, didn't hit him. I'm not sure if they hit him. And then they also took all of his cans, right? And so there was a lot of racial taunting, a lot of, there was theft, right? Um, and that, that, that was a form of anti-Asian violence in the sense that somebody said, I, you know, I hate Asians. Okay, there's that. So what happens is there's this huge social media campaign to look for the, for the young people, um, to incriminate them, to criminalize them, to charge them. What ends up happening is a number of Chi like Chinese Americans and other communities, black, well, black communities came and um, advocated. Actually, it was the older gentleman who wanted restorative justice instead of criminalizing and convicting the young men or the younger men who was involved in this. So that's the restorative justice that I think she's talking about. But also I want us to think about what wasn't implicated was the poor conditions by which all these men were operating under. So why is it that a black man is stealing cans that are maybe worth $200, right? What is the context that all this is happening under? Social media wasn't interested in implicating the poverty that these men were living under. What they wanted to do was like, here's this violence. And yes, we most definitely need to take care of that man, of the elder who was hurt, and all the other elders who actually have been hurt by a number of forms of violence against them. We need to center them. And then we also need to center, you know, the systems that made these forms of violence possible. I'm going to leave it there because I feel like I just said a million words. Thank you, people, for not shutting down the, the, the webinar on my face. Um, I wanted to be able to bring Yvonne in um, uh, before we move on um, to see if you had any thoughts in terms of what um, folks have been sharing in the, the around solidarity. Wow. Thank you, Saki. Um, yeah, I feel like I've just been listening and absorbing and, and thank you for just the wise words that everyone has been sharing here. Um, I think going back to your original question, Saki, in terms of solidarity, um, you know, I think the only thing that I would add to that is my understanding is that um, solidarity, yes, it is a new type of person that we can give birth to, and it's a new type of an economy and different types of social relationships that that can that can happen. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things that um, Solidarity Research Center does, we were actually born out of um, um, worker struggles. We were the research arm of the industrial workers of the world. And then we um, um, grew to assist other types of um, organizing movements and um, have recently, um, you know, um, assisted people in terms of building solidarity economies. Um, and that's just the idea that we can, you know, create 
worlds that are equitable, that are sustainable, and that are inclusive as well. Um, yeah, so so thank you for including me, Saki. <laughs> Yeah, I, I see Feroz's hand go up and I wasn't sure if earlier on there was like a, a thumbs up and I thought he might be trying to um, interject as well. Feroz, you want to take yourself off a mute and, and add anything? Um, ju just a few points. I, th I mean, I, I think some really important issues have been raised here, um, but I think it's really important to distinguish between uh, racism as white supremacy, racism as an expression of power, uh, a, a power which seeks to dehumanize most of humanity, uh, and racism as an attitude. Uh, because although they're related to each other, uh, it's important to understand the different dimensions of each um, because I think it's important to to identify to, to 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 talk about identity not so much in where the way in which we may perceive ourselves but rather that identity is forged in the struggle to reclaim one's humanity, that it's a struggle to not just reclaim, but to, in a sense, invent what it means to be human. Um, and, and, and I think um, we have to keep coming back to the history of the, the genocides, the, the mass killings, the colonialism, the destructions, the colonizations, all these crimes were based, were, were, were based on a perception by white supremacy that we are less than human. And, and it is that experience of being forced to be considered less than human that gives us the greatest potential the greatest possibility to understand what it means to be human. And therefore the claim for a struggle against racism, a struggle against imperialism, an anti-colonial struggle, all of these are claims to reassert a humanity and to assert that there is a universalist humanity. It's not a sectoral, it's not a special interest group I'm Chinese or I'm Indian or I'm this or I'm that, that I claim an identity for, but rather that it is a much larger claim, that of seeking to establish a universalist humanity. Those are my small points. Um, Feroz, there was also something that you shared in the comment. I'm wondering if you can expand um, a little bit. You said that um, solidarity is what love looks like in the streets. Um, slash struggles. Yeah, I, I, I think that is an important thing, that, 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 that if we are not, if, if we recognize ourselves as human, then, then what binds us must be some form of love, must be an expression of love. Shea and many other revolutionaries uh, express this. I mean, for all the good ones uh, did that. Uh, if, one, if one reads Marx, his understanding, his profound understanding of the need for a universal humanity is so important. And I think the way of expressing it to say solidarity is what love looks like on the street. Solidarity is what's, what happens in struggles. It's because we recognize each other as humans, as social beings, that we want to express that love. And it is exactly that 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 empire that white supremacy fears, and I think I want to just raise that question that that um, uh, Michelle Alexander raised uh, in an essay in the New York Times last year, in which she said, "We have to stop saying that we are we are the resistance. No, no, no. We are not the resistance. We are those who are seeking to to." invent and create a new world 
it is they who are the resistance. It's they who are resisting us. If we build ourselves on love, it is they who will build their world on hate. Uh, not to get too far off, and I don't want to split hairs, but I guess it's who I am. I, 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 I kind of wonder when I hear those types of sentiments expressed, um, I appreciate them, and I appreciate them coming from you, Feroz, but I, I also feel that there's a caution there, or that there, there should be some caution because I feel like black people, and by black people I'm talking about in particular, in specificity, new African people, black folks within the US, we sometimes tend to get lost in that or forgotten or erased in that our particular location, our particular history, our particular, for lack of a better word, struggle, sometimes gets collapsed or entirely erased. And, you know, I'm not one to, I, I don't want to, I don't want to cloak myself in victimhood and hold on to it. But I do think that uh, it's wonderful to struggle to be human, but I am also a new African. I'm also from LA. I mean, I, you know, I got all these different things going on in the grand scheme of things. Yes, I'm a child of the creator. I, I, I share humanity with all of, of humanity, but there's some specific things going on that I think need to be addressed at the point of impact. And, and I, I just feel like, I just feel like, as we talked about in the beginning, giving voice to what those concerns are and how they fit in the larger scheme. So giving voice to who African people within the United States of America are and how we got to this particular place and what it looks like for us right now today on May 19, 2020. I think that that needs to be given voice to as we struggle for this new world, we wanna build this new society in which we are all human. So that might be hair splitting. I apologize if it is, but you know, sometimes I just can't help myself. Hey, Tandy, that, that's, if that's hair splitting, it must be a pretty big hair. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that, mm -hmm. I'll, say, I'll just add to what you said, because the, sometimes, and, and Feroz, I accept, I accept your statement, right? And I know what you mean when you talk about love here with this crowd. Um, I'll add to what you just said, Tandy, and just really meant to compliment what you just said, that sometimes the insistence on love and solidarity actively criminalizes Black people. Uh, because because the whole tradition of black struggle has oftentimes entailed expressions of love that are received, felt, and interpreted by other non-black people as expressions of anger, rage, and violence, as if those things are somehow mutually opposed to each other, which they are not, right? What can be full of anger, rage, and violence in their love for one's people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, Safiya Bukhari being one of our best examples, right? David Fagan being an incredible example. So. So I just want to, you know, amplify what you're saying, Tandi, by saying love must not be conflated with pacifism or ideological proto-religious adherence to anti-violence. We cannot conflate those things. For many peoples, um, Black peoples in particular, the struggle to be human is already a condition of intimacy with violence. So, so, so that struggle for humanity is inherently a violent struggle because what you're fighting against is a fucking world order. And that's a loving struggle. That's a loving fight. Uh, Sheo. I saw Feroz shaking his head, particularly around the um, part about not conflating love with, you know, pacifism or inaction or looking like a kumbaya. Like I don't. I don't think that that's. It, no, I can we, speak we, for we are in. facing we're facing daily uh, a, a a world of violence of all kinds, uh, and and you can't just simply reduce it to to armed violence. Is that as well as many other forms of violence? Patriarchy in itself is a form of violence. 
It, it is about dehumanizing others. Uh, racism is about dehumanizing others. Uh, and, and I'm saying, well, listen, my specificity is very different to that of Tandy, and I accept that, and of Dylan and everyone. But what does unite me in any struggle that I engage in is that and any solidarity that I wish to express has to be on the understanding that, that my freedom is tied up, is intimately tied up with other people's ambition, strive for inventing what it means to be human. Because if that's not our ultimate goal, that, then, then we'll end up fighting with each other. If we say, yes, we celebrate that diversity, it's not about cultural differences, it's not about necessarily historical differences, but it is about saying that, that there is a violent world in which we have to counterpose to create something new. And that has to be created on a completely different uh, uh, premise from that of empire. It looks like we might have 40, 40 something minutes left in this two hour time frame. Uh, I'm hoping that if no one minds, we can move towards the, uh, the portion where people can talk about their work with mutual aid and solidarity and uh, cooperative economies to give us you know, some practical things, not only that people are involved in, but that uh, everyone can plug into. And uh, I want to apologize. I was not as prepared as I should have been, which is why I've been kind of stumbling uh, uh, over my words, had a lot going on. But I'm thinking that if we can move into that portion of this, um, and I, I would love to give, <laughs> I would love to give voice to some of the comments, or if there, I don't want to ask for questions from the viewers because then we'll be bombarded. But if there's a way we can give voice to some of the comments that people are leaving. But I also wanted to say real quick before we move into this section, uh, just again, back May 19th, uh, the birth date of these individuals, you know, Ho Chi Minh, who lived in Harlem for a time. And uh, the story goes, he used to wear his hair processed as a conch. And if you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, you know, what that conch looked like. The story goes, Ho Chi Minh heard Marcus Garvey speaking. And when he said, Africa for the Africans, Asia for the Asians, it, it, it clicked in him. And he said, what the hell am I doing? And he went back to Vietnam and he freed his people from the colonialism of the French. Malcolm X, birth date of May 19th, would speak fondly and lovingly many times of the Vietnamese struggle, talking about Dien Bien Phu, where the uh, French were run out, thrown out of Vietnam, and talking about the fact that for some reason Black people saw no fear going to fight in Vietnam, but were afraid to fight against white supremacy here on this soil. Malcolm X also talking about how he appreciated the uh, Bandung Conference of the Non-Aligned Movements in, uh, in 1955, I believe it was. And we've already talked about uh, Yuri Kochiyama. We talk about Lorraine Hansberry sharing a birth date with these three people, but we don't always talk about Lorraine Hansberry's significance to the civil rights movement. We think of Lorraine Hansberry as simply a playwright who wrote um, one of the things that we've uh, come, come to love her for, A Raisin in the Sun, and another play, The Sign in Sydney, Brewstein's Window. But what we don't always talk about is her last play called LeBlanc's, where she looks at the problems of African countries coming out of colonialism. What are the internal problems? What are the issues of quote unquote, for lack of a better word, tribalism? What are the issues with modernity and holding on to tradition and holding on to what the colonizer has left? And so when we look at the issues of imperialism on the continent, that's one of the reasons why it's able to take hold because of the vestiges of what an invader has left. Uh, in, in many instances. And so we give honor and praise to Lorraine Hansberry. Uh, again, just stating some of the reasons why we come together on this date to have these, this discussion that we're having in honor of Lorraine Hansberry, Malcolm X, Yuri Kochiyama, 
and uh, Ho Chi Minh. And so in the time that I have left, uh, but, but for Rose, are there any comments that- uh, Connie wants to make one. Can oh, I make Connie, one? Okay, <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. I try to raise my hand, it's okay. So I just kind of wanted to make uh, a couple of comments before we move on to what do we do or how do we come together? Um, because I think it's really important um, to not, you know, Dylan was talking about conflating pacifism and love, and I think that's a really great intervention. But I want us to caution again uh, ourselves in conflating our struggles and our desires for freedom as the same. Because I think that some of our freedoms are predicated upon the unfreedom of others. And I think that's a really important point to make um, as we think through or to sit with and, and, and make as a part of our struggle. If our, some of our freedoms, if we live in an anti-Black, anti-Indigenous world, then many of our freedoms are predi predicated upon those forms of violence. The benefits. Right? Yeah. Benefiting, but also al being allowed to live. Not mm -hmm. just like reaping benefits and getting like, you know, a nice purse, which is a part of it, but being allowed to live, right? And, and quote, and breathe while others are not. And I say that metaphorically and literally when we're talking about COVID as a respiratory infection. And then we think about, you know, Eric Gardner, right? Like some people are not allowed to breathe while others can freely breathe, right? And their lack of access to breath, right? Or their, their ability to breathe is, pre is predicated on someone else's inability to breathe. So that has to be, you know, um, factored into this idea of, um, uh, solidarity and in terms of love because I can love you if that like for me when I think about this idea of love I'm like you know thinking about it personally my love for for you has to be unconditional in a in racial solidarity Meaning if that means that I gotta go, that means I gotta go. I love you that much. I love our freedoms that much that if I have to be not, if I have to be gone, then I have to be gone. Because I don't know if that makes sense, but you can't, we, we, you ha we have to really stop thinking about solidarity as a very, like at the end of it, it's gonna be peaceful, right? And that leads to the second point, because I'm a Vietnamese woman, you know, whose family came here in 1975. And when we posted this thing about Uncle Ho, you know, I was scared because my family, you know, we come from across, you know, the, the, the country, but my family lost everything coming here, right? My, my grandfather, every morning for many years would be wailing, starting at like six in the morning, crying screaming and crying and when my mom was in the hospital for her health conditions and and in a county hospital at that because our family is so broke my mom in her hallucinations and i hope she doesn't get upset for me sharing this but she would ask like why is there a so soldier kicking that kid in the head right so we cannot romanticize solidarity and we cannot romanticize war and we cannot romanticize the fucking outcome of it because lives will be destroyed. And then we got to live with that or die with it. And, it, and, it, it, it. and I say this because when I say a revolution, when we say a revolution is possible or a revolution is, is necessary, it is an unfucking doing And there is no going back. And that means that when we do racial solidarity, we got to prepare people for that. And for people who don't have anything to lose, but everything to gain, they should probably be the ones at the forefront. So that's thank that. you. No, thank you so much for sharing that. It needed to be shared. And, you know, one of the things I think about when I hear a discussion, such as what you just put forth, it reminds me of something that um, Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso said, he said, power must be conquered by a conscious people. It means that we have to be responsible. You know, I juxtapose that against how people think freedom means I can walk around without a mask. You know, I don't, I shouldn't have to uh, have my comfort disturbed. I want to go into your Walmart or your restaurant without a mask. That's not the kind of freedom we're talking about. And you're absolutely right. It is an undoing. It's an undoing. And it's, very easy for me sitting where I'm sitting right now in my bedroom to romanticize 
uh, what happened in China. You know, listening to Malcolm X talk about no more toms in China because some people were taken out and rounded up. You know, I can, I can easily get with that and romanticize it because I wasn't there. You know, I can very easily romanticize it. And so I appreciate you, sister, for saying that. Uh, for bringing that to the fore. We, we are talking about an undoing and there are going to be some people who are going to get hurt. I, I, I understand that. I feel that. But when you say, like I said, we're trying to get free. Some people, you know, we're, we're trying to breathe. A lot of us are trying to breathe. And like you said, this society is built on anti-indigeneity, anti-blackness. We trying to breathe. And I sincerely hope that my brothers and sisters, and that's what I'm gonna call y'all, my brothers and sisters who are not black, who, are, who want to be committed to the struggle, who want to come with us. You know, I, I hope that you can come with us. I hope that you can be able to breathe with us. But I, you know, I know it's not gonna be easy. How do I know? Because I study history. So I think it's not gonna be his, easy. I don't know. I, I've never been involved in a war other than watching Crips and Bloods. So I don't know what that struggle looks like. I know what you have told me and what others have told me. I do know it's an undoing. I do know that it's uncomfortable. I also know that it has to be in order for people to breathe. So again, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, um, like you say, you know, it's, it's not about, uh, you know, when we solidarity, being accountable and working struggling with one another. Hope I did not cause you or your family too much uh, pain and trauma in bringing this up while we celebrate this day, talking about Ho Chi Minh. You know, I, I don't want to take up any more space, but I just want to share with us, you know, I'm, I'm getting texts that like there's comments. I don't know them. Yeah. And I do, I, what I do know is that a lot of us have been hurting from all of these empires and all of these wars that are ongoing. Right. So what does it mean to, to um, see each other and to move forward? I have a, a dear friend, um, you know, she goes by decolonizing therapy on social media. Um, Dr. Jen, really dope, Amer like a dope human being. And she says, who are we going to be moving forward? Who do you want to be and what worlds we want to create? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I just I just um, want to recognize that both and real quickly and then stop talking so i apologize <laughs> I, 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 I apologize and i i thank you yeah i don't i don't think that you need to apologize i think this is one of the reasons why we wanted to do it again and to have more time for it um people are um saying and commenting about how powerful this discussion is um i think tandy you wanted to bring in a couple of comments that folks have been saying and Feroz has shared some. Um, there are a couple of them on Facebook, but I think like after we do that, um, paying attention to time and making sure that we do um, spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the work around building a solidarity economy. I mean, one of the things that I thought about um, and wanted to hear from folks is like, what role um, does that this, a solidarity economy and, and developing and strengthening and building a solidarity play in, in what we're talking about in terms of the relationship between our communities and, um, um, and solidarity. Uh, so before some, we jump into- Some of them questions look long and involved. I'm yeah, so I wasn't that. necessarily thinking of folks necessarily um, answering all the questions but at least us being able to share what those are for um people who are listening who may not be able to see them and, and at least give um uh some recognition to the folks who are in um, engaging watching and also engaging um so um one person christian would love to hear some transnational perspectives from the speakers do you all have thoughts on the radical Black Chinese solidarity under Mao and how that's been portrayed now. Betrayed now. Um, I think that that could go into a whole lot. So I guess we'll decide collectively which ones we want to tackle, um, given how much time we have. Another person um, is kind of saying, and I think this may be in response to um, Connie um, and talking about the long, arduous work of um, actually 
developing, building, and practicing solidarity. Why does progress take so long? Is it possible that these things take longer because specific social groups hold on to their proximity to whiteness and weigh those benefits against solidarity and working from the bottom, quote unquote? Um, uh, there's one person who um, commented on Facebook, Justin Gifford, as a person of white cis privilege. I see myself as both colonized and colonizer. The sentiment that my liberation is tied to others resonates strongly with me. How do me and my comrades participate in these broader liberation movements in solidarity? Um, um, and then I don't know if Feroz, you were posting a couple of these as yourself and interjecting some questions um, or sharing um, what other people were saying, like, where does revolution fit in when people are theorizing how to demand justice and fighting for their lives by upholding, upholding the imperialist and capitalist system that still profits off of Black and Native um, peoples, indigenous peoples, brown refugees, immigrant bodies. Um, yeah, Feroz, was that a question that no, you were no, posing? Or that no, no, that was just putting some that stuff because it's kind of, there's, okay. there, there's 241 comments already uh, oh, uh, yeah. just on the organizing in the time of COVID. So, but I did notice that Diane Fujino uh, said that she had a, uh, well, wanted mm -hmm. to provide a, a historical context. And I wonder, um, whether we, we might hear from Diane. Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to, to respond historically and kind of globally. I just want to check in. Is, is that where you guys want to go or do you want to move to the present around mutual aid and cooperative economics? Shall I go? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think we have, I think we have some time. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I want to, um, touch back to what Connie was saying about how the freedom of some is predicated on the unfreedom of others. And um, in the, the, the early Cold War, the immediate post-World War II moment is really crucial to understanding how this operates and what happened in terms of building the model minority racialization of Asian Americans and certain opportunities of Asian Americans predicated on exclusion of Blacks, and on the unfreedom of Blacks and others. So <clears throat> people have written about this and, um, and I'm, I'm, anyways. And so at that moment when the US rises to become a global power, right, the dominant global power, it is trying to um, fight for empire building in the Asian Pacific region. And as a result of this, it is wanting to show itself as different from old world colonialism, right? It's building a different kind of colonialism, a neo-colonialism that isn't predicated on um, old world territorial conquest in the same way, but more on economic and political control. And so the US is vying for control of the Asia Pacific region. And at the same time, trying to distinguish itself from old world colonialism and articulating ideas of American exceptionalism and trying to showcase itself as the model of freedom and democracy and anti-racism in the world. And it is at this moment that Japanese and Chinese, the two largest groups in the, of Asian Americans in the US, gain different kinds of structural access to residential neighborhoods, to job mobility, and other kinds of access. Um, but this is happening, you know, entirely because of the global struggles for empire building in the Pacific. And I think it's really crucial that that's understood in this moment and at this time. And one of the crucial things that happens in this moment is in 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act grants naturalization and citizenship to Asian Americans, primarily Japanese Americans. And at the time, the um, moderate civil rights group, the Japanese American Citizens League, somewhat akin to the NAACP, composed more of middle class and professional members, um, is fighting strenuously to gain citizenship and naturalization rights for Japanese Americans. And it makes sense because hundreds of laws were predicated on their quote unquote aliens ineligible for citizenship status. 
And so by overturning that and granting naturalization rights, it would overturn legal discrimination against Japanese Americans. It makes sense. But at the same time, there was a little known group called the Nisei Progressives that actually opposed the McCarran-Walter Act, opposed their own self-interest, opposed um, gaining naturalization rights through the McCarran-Walter Act because it did many things. One, it discriminated against Blacks. It um, removed the quotas for um, West Indians, uh, it, uh, 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 which were virtually unlimited. It was, as, as people know, uh, anti-left and anti-radical uh, position and engaged in anti-communist uh, dating. And it also was anti-Asian. Asians were the only group that were um, enumerated and given quotas based not on um, uh, their national origins, but on their ancestry. So a Chinese anywhere in the world would count in the tiny quotas of 105 for all Chinese. It wasn't like they would get in through, say, France's quotas. Oh. And so for those reasons of it being anti-Black, anti-Asian, and anti-left, the Nisei progressives opposed this. And so I think that theirs is a really important example of fighting for solidarity at a moment when they themselves were so vulnerable, right? Emerging straight out of the concentration camps. And it gives us an example of people who were not willing to gain their own freedom predicated on the unfreedom of others, either in this country or globally to benefit the US empire building in the Asian Pacific region. Okay. That's what I wanted to say about that. So we're just almost at about half past the hour. Um, and for me, that's almost 930. Um, <laughs> you all 730 for Rose. It's like almost 1030. Um, and so I, I, we have about, you know, roughly 30 minutes before we kind of like have a few minutes to at the very end to wrap up. Um, can we maybe hear um, from Yvonne and Connie Wen um, and then, you know, open it up for um, everybody else, um, just thinking of you two in particular, um, since we haven't heard from you in a little while, about the role that um, a solidarity economy can play in um, all of what we're talking about now. Like, what, what, um, what's the difference what is the solidarity economy? What's the difference um, compared to what we see now? How is it something that um, uh, actually can change um, the conditions that we are experiencing now? Um, and yeah, and, and then and help in efforts to build um, solidarity amongst um, um, African and, and Asian communities. Connie, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will say, um, so I mean, in terms of solidarity economy, this is something that we are practicing within a firm in our organization, right? So um, we, our membership and actually our leadership is multiracial in terms of like, we have API women leaders, we have, um, Latinx, immigrant, um, native, and also black women leaders within our organization. So we are continuing to practice how we sort of um, practice solidarity within our organization and struggle it out based on our personal histories and our lived experiences um, in this space. Um, I think that as we think about a solidarity economy, I think that race is a huge factor that we need to address. And so I'm really glad that we're coming together today to, to talk about this. Um, but I, I also want to lift up the fact that like, and as Froze mentioned, patriarchy is violence, right? And so we, we really also have to bring in gender into the discussion about the future that we are building and how we actually dismantle, you know, current systems of oppression, how we dismantle imperialism. 
Um, because, I mean, if, again, if you think about the way that our economy is structured, you know, women make up the vast majority of the low wage workforce. And I will continue to say this, right, because that is actually really key. Um, and so we've got to think about sort of like, not just based on race, but also gender. And then for women who are women of color, right, sort of like how that plays. Um, and um, and so within a firm, we're also thinking about sort of what does that future look like? We've been, you know, asking ourselves this question of like, um, you know, and, in, and trying to engage our radical imaginations in terms of what does the, what does a feminist future look like, right? Um, and informed by women of color. And so um, I think that the, the path forward is, again, we've really got to figure out not just on an interpersonal level, but how we actually challenge capitalism, right? So we, when we talk about transnational solidarity and perspectives, and we look at the current crisis, and we look at coronavirus, and we see that Trump is trying to position the United States to actually be, have the exclusive rights over the vaccine that will come one day. We've seen this before in terms of HIV AIDS medication not being available in Africa, in parts of the global South. And we will see that again under coronavirus if Trump succeeds to secure exclusive property rights on, um, on vaccines. So I think like at a high level, there's also this thing that like, what's good for the United States is not necessarily good for the rest of the world. So even as we struggle it out within the United States in terms of like, in you know, um, uh, sort of racial tension and struggling that out on an interpersonal level, we've got to think that the, what we do here in the United States impacts the world globally, right? So as people are here fighting for their opportunity to risk their lives for capitalism and go back to the workforce, um, all along people in the global south have been working um to to maintain capitalism for us right and so as we look forward in terms of how we get out of this that will continue to be the question whatever is the solution here may not necessarily be the global solution so we need to think about that um in this context so i'll hand it over to yvonne um so one of the things that um, I've been looking at has been inspired by a book by a mentor of mine, Jessica Gordon Nephart. She um, wrote a history, I have the book here actually, Collective Courage, which is a history about um, Black cooperative practices and traditions. And so myself and a colleague, I don't know if he's watching right now, Prague, um, we wanted to look for that tradition within Asian American communities. Um, and so um, you know, we did a, a historical dive and found that there were many of these practices um, in our communities. Um, you know, when, when many of our people came here, we were excluded from capitalism and we had to find other ways to survive. And so we survived based on familial solidarity, ethnic solidarity, and labor solidarity. We formed clan associations. We created rotating credit associations. Um, we created mutual aid and benevolent societies, and then we also um, created cooperatives as well. Um, and we found this in, um, yeah, there's, there's Jessica's book, Collective Courage. Um, and so we found these in many communities from, you know, um, Sikhs who came here, who um, formed farming cooperatives to Filipinx um, farm workers who also created similar types of worker cooperatives. Um, to Chinese immigrants as well. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think, you know, you know, going back to the question of solidarity economy, I think, you know, um, I think it's an economy where, you know, where our humanity is valued, where, you know, um, the planet is valued as well. Um, another mentor of mine, Emily Kwano, has written extensively about the solidarity economy, and um, you can find a lot of 
her writings um, on the website for U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, usfen.org. Um, and um, but I, I think something. This is more of a question that I would throw back out there. You know, something I think about. You know, so so there's examples. For instance, um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a a worker cooperative garment factory that was made up of Chinese and Filipinx workers in San Francisco. Um, it was called, so it was started by um, students and um, community members that were involved in the third world movement. Um, and they were inspired. So many of them were involved in the um, struggle to set up ethnic studies at SF State in Berkeley. Um, and they were inspired by an article by Stokely Carmichael that divines Black power is economic power by co-ops um, by African Americans in the South and also cooperative models in China. And so um, in 1971, they set up a cooperative garment factory. Um, and the first um, item of clothing that they, they created was the Mao jacket, which they apparently sold at Macy's. <laughs> um, so I, I guess to say that I feel like the solidarity economy, like in terms of racial solidarity, I think we inspire each other. One question I have is, you know, as we create our economies, like, um, like, you know, I think I, I sort of, I agree with Connie, I, and I think I agree with Tandi as well. I think a lot of what we, what we struggle for may not be the same thing. I think they're distinct. And so are our solidarity economies, like, um, you know, how do they relate to each other? I, I'm not being very eloquent, and in part because I'm just so amazed by the brilliance of everyone that's on this panel, but I'm throwing this question back out there, I think, to folks on this panel, and also to the folks that are watching as well. Like, like is, my, is my solidarity economy the same as, you know, um, Tandi's solidarity economy, in other words? I'm not Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we didn't necessarily unpack what the um, what the differences and commonalities are in terms of um, the, uh, experiencing things like the economy um, and how. Uh, I mean, we've named like colonialism, imperialism, white supremacy, you know, there's capitalism, patriarchy, but we didn't necessarily like um, in detail talk about what that experience ends up being um, um, in, in like specific ways, right? And so I guess in one current way, it's like the disproportionate impact that COVID is having on black people whose access to healthcare and whose health um, was disproportionately like um, ridiculous anyway, right? And so, so healthcare, work, um, uh, those are some of the areas, but I think that if we, if we can talk about how, or think about how um, it may be different for, for us and even how maybe culturally a practice of um, um, uh, cooperating or sharing in terms of what needs are are different then 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 that may um, that may help shed light on how it would be different but but the thing that I think of is like isn't there like I see a lot more commonality when you're thinking about people's inability to feed themselves, feed their children, their inability to, um, or, or just like having to be forced to make decisions on what gets paid for, um, you know, um, having to put uh, your body on the line, having to sacrifice your relationship, like your um, raising your own children in order to provide food, shelter, and clothing for your children. Those are just some of the examples that come to my mind that when we're, when, um, we're talking about building a solidarity economy um, and what that looks like in terms of even potentially moving away from a cash um, economy, um, that, you know, it's like there are some basic level things 
that our needs would be met and our lives would look tremendously different, right? And so isn't, so one of the things that came to my mind um, just a couple of minutes ago was like, yes, there will be differences and there are differences, but isn't there also like a class dimension that, um, that means that we are experiencing uh, exploitation in, in some very similar ways? I see heads nodding. <laughs> Um, and so if, if, if you're, if we're, we're like, so what is that? Like, what is that? How does that play out? And then what would that, what would that, how would that look differently um, with the change in um, how we, um, with a change in like what work means, what an economy means um, and an alternative economy um, that actually puts people before profit. Um, but folks don't mind, I just am jumping in here. Um, but I think, I mean, you're really speaking to a lot of what we as an organization are sort of wrestling with and you know that we're using solidarity economy here, but I think in a firm and probably outside of a firm, we, we think of this as collective care, right? So going beyond the individual self and thinking about like and beyond empowerment and how we are leveraging our resources, our histories, um, and uh, so that we can sort of take care of one another. So mutual aid is one of the things that we're seeing happening here. Um, and I think that for a firm, we think of this sort of like in three different, you know, the three faces of power. So there's sort of like the ideological work that we are doing to help people make meaning of this moment and to shape like what it is that we are calling for and imagining for our future and how we move beyond this. Um, and then there's the political work. So what are the concrete like political victories that we can make? And in COVID, unfortunately, the bar is very low because things are so bad in this moment. So like mutual aid, we have, um, you know, some members uh, on the west side of LA who are delivering food to people in their community. Um, so shout out to Venice Eats, um, that is happening right now. Um, we also have members that are leading um, in terms of supporting immigrants and um, fighting for immigrant rights in this moment. As we know, um, undocumented immigrants particularly are being largely excluded from the discussion um, and sort of like marginalized and assumed to not have any rights. Um, and what we are seeing is decarceration of immigrants, um, but beyond that sort of like what happens to people and so supporting people and understanding their rights. Um, so that's some of the work that we're doing. And then, um, you know, pre COVID just before everything started to shut down, a firm was convening um, here in Los Angeles, a, you know, a feminist basically skills sharing workshop and we brought in a lot of our allies here. Um, so, um, you know, SWANA, which is um, Southwest Asian, North African um, organization. And then also, um, you know, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and Las Comadres. So a lot of our allied organizations here in Los Angeles to sort of like practice um, and impart to others sort of like how we are surviving. So sharing organizing skills, how we are growing our movements, how we are addressing fundamental needs. Um, so some of these things that we're talking um, that Yvonne even brought up in terms of benevolent societies and those kinds of things. Like how are we replicating those models and learning from how our ancestors survived um, and how can we use that in this moment? And so we are thinking about sort of like how we make that a virtual thing um, right now, but um, yeah. So I think that, that that's just what I wanted to sort of like bring in in terms of like drawing upon the knowledge and experience and what we know in our blood um, from our ancestors and our, our relatives who have survived up until this point and using it to sort of push us forward in this moment. So, yes, Connie, if you 
all can talk about the different mutual aid projects that are happening now. And, and I'm thinking of like, not sharing what those are, or like, sharing any potential examples or stories that that you see playing out that actually lends to um, this idea of, um, uh, you know, stronger relationships between our communities and solidarity. Like, are any of you seeing um, that play out or not, and if it's not necessarily playing out now, what are what are lessons of what's happening right now um, that can inform how we build and strengthen uh, relationships uh, and solidarity across communities? Does that make sense? Um, so I I can try to tackle that uh, and I can try to tackle that and, and hope that it's helpful. So for a couple of things um for our for aap women lead we have been learning from a number of organizations and people including mia mingus from bay area transformative justice collective um, from mariam kaba who is of um, project nia um, and from a number of other organizations survived and punished so we've learned from these folks, um, and that's important because we want to remind everyone that mutual aid, and I know everyone here knows this, but mutual aid has been going on for a pretty long time um, beyond COVID, right? And it's, a, it's a, also a commitment to a certain set of politics. So I'll just say that. Um, given that AAP Women Lead has done a couple of things. One is we launched, um, a, a different set of, a, we, we launched a community care series online, which is where we're doing some education um, because we couldn't access people. And so we were hoping to share as much knowledge as we could with our community organizations, community members. Um, and those folks include acupuncturists, they include like yoga practitioners who are, um, you know, they, they do meditation. Um, and also political and social educators, right? And Dylan included, Eddie Zhang included, um, Mia Mingus included. All these folks are helping to share knowledge around how to take care of our well beings, both politically, socially, and physically, right? So there's that aspect of it. And we talk about it in the context of all of our communities, not just you know, Asian and Pacific Islanders. So that's really important, right? It's knowledge that we're sharing with everyone as a type of aid. The other thing that we're doing is we recently launched a youth-led mutual aid project, which means that we're fundraising. Because we have the ear of some people, we're fundraising, um, and this is, our, our youth intern leads this, her name is Sarah Rincon, um, and that we're, we're, because young people are really unemployed right now, like underemployed, they've been laid off from any type of, like kind of the, the service industry, um, they were, were asking, so we've raised money. I'm sorry, I'm getting really tired. We've raised money. We're raising money so that our young people um, who are creating mutual aid projects among themselves um, and who are creating mutual aid projects to support their communities um, can apply for these grants so that they can, they can take care of each other, right? And we're specifically emphasizing undocumented um, youth um, who are working with, with uh, families across race and ethnicities. So this isn't just for Asian and Pacific Islanders, it's for all of our communities. So there's that type of mutual aid work. Um, I know that I've contributed as much, you know, I don't, as, as much as I can to other um, funds that have been created, relief funds. Um, I know a lot of folks who are involved in the informal economy are drastically underemployed right now. So we're, we're trying to give money where we can and resources. I'm also part of, um, our organization just partnered with a number of other people to create this thing called Mask Oakland, um, or Mutual Aid Collective Oakland rather. And what we're doing is raising money and getting money from different um, spaces to create hygiene kits, 
cash assistance, food assistance, and masks. We're trying to distribute about 30,000 masks across Oakland, and most specifically to unhoused communities, to um, senior communities, to low-income OUSD communities. So all of our efforts are going to all of our communities, actually. Um, and I don't know if that helps to answer the question, but I'm hoping that we learned from the two folks that I mentioned um, and are doing mutual aid correctly or usefully. Mm -hmm. um, Diane, you want to speak about Cooperation Santa Barbara? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to emphasize what Connie Wynn mentioned that we need to be not just building solidarities interpersonally, but we need to be challenging capitalism. And I think that that is one of the things that's so important about building a cooperative economy, right? This isn't just building a organization, which we all know is very difficult. It is trying to build an alternative e political economy because the current economy ain't working, right? This neoliberal austerity is failing all of us, just like capitalism is failing environmental sustainability. And so um, first I wanna say that one of our biggest inspirations for doing this work in Santa Barbara is Jackson, Cooperation Jackson, and that's why we are calling ourselves Cooperation Santa Barbara. It was a pleasure to meet you a couple of summers ago, Saki, in Jackson. And um, the book, Jackson Rising, right, by Kali Akuno and Ajamu Nangwakya, I'm sorry, I killed that, um, is, is phenomenal, right, as a comprehensive blueprint of what a solidarity economy and a, and a cooperative city can look like. And, you know, Tandi, you had said before, oh, it seems like Santa Barbara would be a place that this wouldn't happen, right? And I get that in part. I mean, I'm from LA too, right? And before I came here, I had an image of quiet and rich and conservative, but that really isn't Santa Barbara at all. We are vast majority people of color, primarily Chicano and Latinx, working class, a lot of undocumented, many monolingual Spanish speaking. And there's a whole infrastructure of service groups. And also there's an alternative culture. You know, uh, they talk about this in Jackson Rising, that it is, it's the, ma the material conditions that we need to change and building worker owned businesses and co-ops and so forth. But we also need to change the culture. And here in Santa Barbara, there already exists a culture of alternative ways of being, of organic gardening and farming and permaculture and uh, of mutual aid. Um, and this is also growing out of the TA strike at UCSB. And I was part of the core faculty organizing group that was in support of that. And we know that the main impetus for that TA strike across the whole UC was um, housing insecurity. And so in Santa Barbara, building off of Cooperation Jackson, building off of other models like EB Perk, right? The East Bay Permanent Real Estate um, Cooperative that people know of the black mothers who were squatting in abandoned buildings and about to be evicted. And then somehow they got this victory of, of having that, uh, that building purchased, right? That was purchased by EB Perk through this for a, a, a housing cooperative. And so there's all this um, work that's possible. And we are going to try to build very, very slowly. I think the most viable cooperatives to build here are farming cooperatives, but also at UCSB, the, there are junior faculty, you know, recent faculty who cannot afford housing in this outrageous housing market. And so want to think about, can we build uh, cooperative housing? And so we are going to need to build on so many different models. And Yvonne, I actually want to talk to you more about this because I think you, you're, you're invested in this much longer than I have been. Um, but I, I'm very excited to do this work. And I think that it also means to think about history differently. So for example, Fannie Lou Hamer, of course, is most well known for right, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and work for black voters and getting beaten up in prison and, or jail and so forth. But she and her husband also had a cooperative pig farm right? But we don't always think about this um, history and, and, our, and our own histories. That's why I'm very excited about what Yvonne, you're doing in terms of documenting the history of Asian American cooperatives um, in terms of, of cooperative economics. We think about it in terms of racial liberation 
Yeah, but, but the two are intricately connected and it's a way that we can fight back against the impositions of racial capitalism. Thank you. I wanted to jump on real quick. I think it's about two minutes after 8 p.m. Pacific time. We were able to start pretty much close to on time. Not that many technical difficulties this time. And I want to be respectful not only of all of your time, but the people who have been watching. Uh, we're not trying to keep you all here much longer, but would like to give maybe five more minutes, just go over maybe five more minutes of our time. Uh, Dylan hasn't uh, spoken with that last word. And if, it, if Feroz and Saki have any last statements, just to make sure we get it all in, if that's okay with everyone. Right on, right on. I'll, be, I'll be real short. Um, oh, sorry, Saki, were you about to talk? No, I was saying that sounds good. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> I'll be real quick. Um, just to put further context and politics on this discussion, which I deeply appreciate, and I, I deeply appreciate all y'all. Um, the, the emergence of, of mutual aid and the traction around, around mutual aid work reminds us once again that, that a key struggle in the current moment and in the hemispheric American moment remains a struggle against anti-Black genocide. What COVID-19 surfaces over and over again are all of the normalized forms of anti-Black violence and colonial anti-Indigenous violence that are already in place and that are formative of, the, of, this, of this entire hemispheric modern project. What COVID-19 is, it emphasizes that, and what mutual aid really is in most ways, it's casualty management. It's counter and potentially anti-genocide work for those, for those communities that are colonized um, and, and that are subjected to anti-Black forms of violence. And so what we're doing in a lot of instances when we participate and, and, and volunteer and do the work of solidarity building in the mutual aid context is we're struggling to manage casualties in asymmetrical domestic warfare. That's, that's really what this is. Um, and, and the last shout out I'll give Dean Spade, my great friend and colleague Dean Spade has a great mutual aid resource website that I don't think we've mentioned yet, but it's called Big Door Brigade. It's online. It shows you all the mutual aid organizations that are all, that are all over the place in North America. Likely, it's likely that anyone who is watching or listening or taking in this discussion, whether it's right now live or later on in the recording, you probably have a mutual aid network or organization near you. Um, I just started working with the Riverside Mutual Aid Network. It was founded by a student I used to, I used to um, work with and mentor a little bit, former ASU, uh, former student body president. Um, I, pr I proudly am working under him now. He's directing me. He's telling me where to go to deliver food. And they've, they, they're potentially about to start a collaboration with the Riverside chapter of All of Us or None, which again brings us back to the fact that, that that the mutual aid work has to deal with people who are incarcerated formerly incarcerated in that in that limbo area of being criminalized and just coming out of jail prison and detention and whatnot so um anybody that that hears this and is taking the politics that we've talked about seriously if you have the capacity the time the energy i can't hear a word you're saying dylan did you am yeah. i the only one did anybody else? Okay, I couldn't, that, that, that very last few words, Dylan, I couldn't hear what you said, you went out. It yeah, nobody could hear you. We yeah, can hear you. I was, I was just urging anybody that hears this to, to go on to Dean Spade's Big Door Brigade and because you likely have a mutual aid organization right near you. And, and keep in mind that doing the mutual aid work is, is as, as Dean would put it, it's a, it's a pathway, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of on-ramp to getting involved with all kinds of radical liberationist, abolitionist, you know, cooperative work um, that, that counters all the forms of violence that we've been talking about here. Okay, okay, thank you so much, Dylan. In Los Angeles, and we'll put up uh, as much information as we can on the Facebook event page, on the COVID-19 page, the Cooperation Jackson page, our personal pages, uh, resources for mutual aid, I know here in Los Angeles, there's the Mert Park Mutual Aid and People for People Los Angeles. So we'll have that information up locally. Uh, Feroz, Saki, do you have any last brief words? I don't have any last brief words. I'll let um, Feroz close us out and maybe you can do a plug for the series that you're doing, Feroz, before we, um, before we end because it is um, very dynamic um, and um, really well done and very hard hitting. Um, I do think though that like uh, building a solidarity economy um, is taking mutual aid like a step further. 
Um, um, and, and so I, I think that um, uh, there's, I'm not sure if I understood all of what you were saying, Dylan. Um, so maybe we can have a side conversation. Um, um, but um, I agree with, I think what Diane said, and I was trying to like write it down really quickly um, in terms of um, the, the alternative economy and the solidarity economy being able to address the, um, uh, the, uh, the manifestation of how we experience racism and violence through the current economy. Um, and so thank you guys all for, for joining us and for giving um, up two hours of your time. For Rose, any closing words? Uh, just to say that I think this has been a really interesting, really excellent discussion. Um, mutual aid linked to building of a solidarity economy. I think it's really, I'm inspired by this because what it shows is the beginnings, the kernels of creating a new world. That this is what it's about. It is about mutual aid. It's about setting different norms to the jungle uh, casino economy that we, we all have to be forced to live in. And so, you know, a, a great admiration to uh, for all of you who are involved in initiatives such as this. Uh, I would like to thank you all for taking time to participate in this really interesting exercise. We will have this up on YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. And um, there are, I mean, it's extraordinary. There are, huge number of, of comments that have uh, 333 comments. Uh, I don't think we've had a discussion uh, where there have been that many comments just on the organizing in the time of COVID. Uh, it's, uh, there are three other um, uh, Facebook pages where it's appearing as well. I haven't looked at those yet. Uh, so as a final word, just say thank you, uh, Connie, Connie, Yvonne, Saki, Dylan, Tandy and Diane. This has been just great. Thank you for joining us on Organizing in the Time of Chaos. This is Feroz Manji okay. closing up for today. Thank you all so much. Okay. Love you all so much. I'm going to take 30 seconds to say one more thing, which is that although we are strongly pushing for and talking about long term economic democracy, building a solidarity and having cooperatives for cooperative sakes is not what we're talking about. And doing that hard work and being able to have an alternative economy doesn't negate all of the work that we talked about and the de defining of what uh, a true solidarity is and having to redefine, um, you know, remold, reshape, even deconstruct ourselves because all of the other systems of oppression aren't going to automatically go away with, with, with creating an alternative economy. So, so you go well, everyone. Peace. Thank you all so much. Take care.